Hi everyone, it's Professor Hall and welcome. We are going to do an overview of American literature today. Part two, 1865 to present. So if you're in my class, um, this is what we are focusing on from basically from the Civil War until today. And if you're not in my class, I also have the first part of American Literature, which I also teach, American Lit Part 1, and you can view those videos on YouTube if you would like. But for now, let's just get started with this. So I said this, um, and if you took American Lit 1 with me or you saw that video, our driving questions for this class our authors and their works really can't be just seen in isolation on their own. A lot of times in um, a class like Introduction to Literature, you might not have that historical or cultural context. You might just be looking at a story or a poem and talking about what it means. For this class, we're going to be doing that, but we're also going to talk about the context for each novel or piece of literature that we are reading. So we're going to talk about the literary movement or school of thought that came before the novel and how the authors might be reacting against <laughs> those literary movements or schools of thought, and sometimes how they're still kind of reflecting some of the, um, the, the thoughts about culture and life. And then we're also going to ask what literary movement or school of thought is the author a part of as they write. And I don't know if I have it here, but also how are they pushing forward? Almost every... I don't want to say famous, I guess that's not the right word, but almost every really well-known book, I think, sits at a crossroads where they kind of reflect the thoughts that came in the past. They're showing what people are kind of thinking and feeling, but they're also being a bit progressive and looking forward toward the future. Um, most of the things that you'll read in school or most of you know what we consider classics do this. So what tensions do we see in the text between the authors and these literary movements? How are they reacting to the past and how are they pushing forward to the future? I like this little pendulum because I think it, it it's a great illustration. A lot of times, I wish I could pause it, <laughs> This is driving me crazy. But a lot of times we do this where um, we believe something in our culture and then we see kind of the problems with it. And so we swing wildly over here and then we believe something completely different and then we kind of go back and forth. And in terms of morality, in terms of um culture and, and certainly history, you can see these things happening over and over and over again. Um, we should be an isolationist country. We should let everyone in, right? <laughs> Even that is a small example. So we're going to talk about the literary movements and how they kind of react against each other and, and how this pendulum kind of works in terms of literature. So first, I want to just give you a brief timeline of everything, and then we'll go into just our portion um, for this class in a little bit more depth. Before 1620, you get a lot of um, Native American literature, most of which was oral um, stories that were passed down orally that were written down later on. There's also a lot of um, notes from explorers, um, letters and journals and travel logs and things like that. So Columbus arriving in the Bahamas, the colony at Jamestown being established would be some notable things um, of that time. Puritanism and colonialism come next. We have a lot of practical writing in that period and in the revolutionary or early nationalism, the age of reason. So there are and I think I've, I don't have pictures, actually, now that I think of it. Um, but we do have, for example, some Puritan poetry. We have some, some writing that is fiction, but is really meant for edification. So it's meant for you to become um, a better person, either morally or religiously, or um, in terms of these new political thoughts that were coming up. So... The Revolutionary War taking place really through the War of 1812s, the early stages of our country. Right at the apex of this, right at the end of this, um, Washington Irving 
is really known as the grandfather of the short story. And this is a depiction of the Headless Horseman and Ichabod Crane in his story, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Some of the first writing that we get in the newly formed United States that's really meant for pleasure and entertainment and not so much for the moral lesson. Um, Transcendentalism takes place between 1830 and 1860, about, and also during this time period we have Romanticism. And this is really, we're going to touch on this because it's going to inform some of the um, other things that we're looking at, but Romanticism and then Transcendentalism at the same time. Um, but Romanticism really is where we get wild stories with these extravagant plots and faraway places and strong emotions and this sense that literature can really be an art and more than just something to teach and instruct um, children and adults. Also during this period of time, we have slave narratives from the 1770s to the 1860s. I have that, but really um, slave narratives were recorded right through the 1950s um, through different projects. But I, I have that those dates because that's sort of the height of popularity, if you will, in terms of how many people were reading them and, and how they were published and how they affected our country. So if you took American Lit One with me, we read things like Frederick Douglass. We look at Harriet Jacobs, possibly um, those narratives and, and how they fit into literature. I don't know why this all popped up all at once, but then we start the periods that we're going to be looking at more closely in this class. Realism and naturalism, which I'll explain in a little bit. Um, modernism, that was really between World War I and World War II. So World War I being from 1914 to 1918. The 1930s with the Great Depression kind of informed a lot of those writers. From 1945 to about 1980 is the postmodern period. Some people would say that our contemporary period um, is still part of that postmodern period, and other people would say that it's not, and we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. But you can tell here this is a piece of modern art, um, and it really does reflect some of what's going on in literature as well, the, the idea of fragmentation, of taking... Um, old shapes and old ideas and pulling them apart and, and questioning reality. You could maybe find some meaning in this. Um, this looks kind of like a crossword puzzle and this might be a calendar, but it really would be subjective. Everybody would look at it differently and that's kind of the point in modernism and postmodernism. So let's get into our periods in a little bit more depth. Romanticism our class starts with writing in 1860, but I do want to talk about Romanticism because so much of what we're going to be looking at is reacting against Romanticism. In this period, writing included fiction and poetry, a lot less philosophy, um, not as much political <laughs> political writings of of people trying to think how to best form the country. Literature, as I said, was for entertainment, not just for political, religious, or educational purposes. Romanticism really then is a philosophical reaction against the previous decades where the focus was on reason and rational thought. A lot of the philosophers of that early national time um, were trying to think logically. So you have people like Locke and Rousseau influencing American writers. You have um, the Federalist Papers written during that time. You have Ben Franklin um, writing How to Live a Perfect Life um, and Make the Best Use of Your Time, which is a, quite an interesting read to anybody who has goals and, and wants to achieve those goals. But you, you know, if you compare that to the picture I have here of Edgar Allan Poe, a dark gothic romantic, 
Um, writers in this period really celebrated individualism, nature, imagination, creativity, intuition, and strong emotion. Some of that is going to carry into the next period, not all of it. Um, not as much with the imagination and creativity, but I think some of it certainly does carry into realism, which is the period after this. But we have a blossoming of short stories, of novels, poetry, the heavy use of symbolism, um, and as I said, some faraway places. Now, I mentioned in the beginning Transcendentalists, one of the writers we're looking at this time, um, depending when you're taking this class, was a transcendentalist, and I'll talk more about her in another lecture. But they had this belief that man's nature was inherently good. So there's a divine spark or an inner light which produces individualism and self-reliance. This was a really important concept during the lead up to the Civil War because they said these people that we are using as slaves are individuals and they have a divine spark within them. Um, they have a soul. And, and for many people, if they were Christians at that time, they were saying, you know, they these many slaves were Christians, which was a, a large argument for setting them free. So the idea of self-reliance... Um, Abolitionists and prohibitionist alcohol led, leads people away from the inner light. Um, slavery denies people their divine spark. And so here you get Henry David Thoreau, you get Emerson, you have um, Frederick Douglass, I would put into this category as well. Some of their writing is nonfiction. Um, things like like Walden I would say is creative nonfiction um things like the slave narratives I just mentioned previously obviously would fall into that nonfiction category as well but a lot of poetry in addition to that I I call that a subset of romanticism because there's still this really uh, strong focus on um these romantic ideals, not love romance, but <laughs> romance with a big R, these romantic ideals of individualism, creativity, nature, and unlike some of the stories where there's faraway plots, um, you don't have that, but, but you do have people who want to be creative and who want to tap into that creative energy inside of them, particularly through nature. So if they worship, it's it's outdoors, as you see in the picture there. The Gothic writers are on what I think of as sort of the opposite end of the spectrum within Romanticism. Instead of that divine spark or light, they're looking at the darkness in people. So there's an interest in fantasy and supernatural, the evil thoughts of man, um, a lot of um, showing how people are, are worthy. Sorry, people are capable of greatness, but they're capable of great evil as well as great good. So what you have with the Gothic writers are, um, again, a lot of focus on creativity and imagination just sort of at the opposite end of the spectrum. So here are just some examples. The Scarlet Letter, Moby Dick um, would be some examples. Again, uh, the, the gothic romanticism here. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path at all and leave a trail. That idea of self-reliance, of making your own way. It's a very American idea that we're going to see as a theme throughout history, not just during this period. But I think really during this period is, is where it comes to fruition. Um, realism is the next period and you can see here in art um, the crowded streets of the city the realism of you know how people dress what they wear how they act how they have 
you know, this isn't romanticized, right? This is the everydayness of having an outdoor marketplace that's crowded, of having um, people sitting on their stoop because it's hot, of hanging laundry from building to building, the realism of picking up the grain that's on the threshing floor. Um, so different parts of the country, different scenes, that's going to become important. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But the realists really rejected the romantic view of life. They said the romantics were too idealistic. Um, realism comes really during and after the Civil War. There are significant industrial inventions. So we have um, the industrialization. There's westward expansion. Um turbulent time in American history, obviously because of the war. So writers turned to real life. And I think that part of that is because of the Civil War. The horrors of, uh, you know, Poe describing a man locking someone in the walls of a house seems silly if you've been in actual battle seeing men die beside you, right? So rather than idealization, we have people seeking verisimilitude. Um, this word, you can think of it meaning very similar. So portraying life as it really is. Stories in that sense are almost like documenting history and they're trying to accurately represent American life. Um, life after the Civil War, the growing middle class, shifts in culture, changes due to immigration and industrialization, those types of things. And we have, this leads into the regionalists, which is a type of realism, I think. Some people would put these as separate movements, but they kind of happened around the same period of time. Um, Mark Twain writing about life on the M Mississippi before the Civil War, during the time that he was a young boy. Bret Hart, pictured here, um, wrote stories of westward expansion and tried to describe what California was like um, during the gold rush period. So the regionalists tried to do this verisimilitude technique, tried to use that to depict life in various regions of the United States. What it means to be an American now that the nation has reformed. What are the different quirks in regions of America? Um, we have another writer, um, Kate Chopin, who's describing Louisiana. We have um, Edith Wharton, I kind of put in a different time period, but she describes life in New York amongst the, the wealthy <laughs> up there. Um, so different writers are, are writing about their life in the place that they live. And that's the idea behind regionalism. The naturalists are quite a bit different. They take the philosophical position that man is a human beast. So a lot more cynical um, coming out of the war and looking at the horrors of war and saying, does any of this matter? trying to depict the natural forces driving human behavior. So this is going to be informed pretty early on by Darwin's theories of evolution. Um, his book on the origin of the species was published in 1859, so right before this period. So a lot of people looking at evolution and, and kind of saying, oh, if that's the driving force, um, as opposed to to God, or if people are destined to the fate, their fate because of genetics and because of evolution. How are we like beasts? How are we ruled by instincts and passions? How are our lives determined by heredity and environment? So these are some questions that kind of are driving some of the authors. So books like The Red Badge of Courage would be a good example looking at um, someone who may not be able to avoid fate because of things like heredity, environment, where they're born, um, all of those types of things. So what is actually the difference if you're confused? Oh, okay, I've read Badge of Courage right here. So I have these two books because I, I think that they demonstrate really well 
how many um, different types of literature even fall within this one movement. But Little Women is a book that I that is written by an author who's a trans transcendentalist or was for a, for a good portion of her life, and because of that, there are some aspects of romanticism still in that book. It was written for children, sort of, but it, it is very idealized in terms of the depiction of American girlhood or, or people in poverty who are still genteel. We'll talk about that more if we read the book for this class. But the Red Badge of Courage, in contrast, is much more cynical. And as I said, looking at some of those um, more aspects of naturalism. But both of them are trying to, are both of these are realist books. They are both trying to depict life as it really was. It's just that the type of realism is is a little bit different. One is a, little, a lot more... Um, optimistic, let's say, and, and one is quite a bit more pessimistic. So William Harmon and Hugh Holman explain, romanticists transcend the immediate to find the ideal. Naturalists plumb the actual or superficial to find the scientific laws that control its actions. And realists center their attention to a remarkable degree on the immediate, the here and now, the specific action and the verifiable consequence. So as we read our book from this time period, that is what I would like you to look for. How are we moving a little bit away from the ideal? How are we looking at the here and now, um, things as they are, those small details that make the book seem like it is really happening, like it's something that was that was real and true. And how do people's actions have immediate consequences? Um, not a lot of symbolism in these books, for the most part. Um, not a, as much um, fanciful creativity, but certainly um, still interesting nonetheless. So after that period comes modernism, and I have these three pictures. I'm going to zoom in here so you can kind of see. Um, we have a woman here in Victorian dress, the high collar and the bustle, the tightly fitted skirts. We have Edwardian. Um, these are British terms, but <laughs> nevertheless, we'll use them for American lit. Um, I'll say 1800s, um, not not quite our time period, and then this would be early 1900s. We're missing here, as I see, um, the period right around the Civil War where people had l very large hoop skirts sort of in between this and this. But um, in comparison, the flapper here from the 1920s, and that is a real picture. You can see if you look real close, the lines in her nylon stockings. Um, the, the cropped hair as opposed to the very long hair put up. But I think these pictures really show how different the culture was um, and how much World War I really did change things. The modern period, these writers were affected by World War I and then just into World War II. The fear of communism, the beginning of the Cold War, um, the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, commercialism. We really don't think about that as much in our culture today. But prior to this point, people are, you know, going to the, the general store and possibly ordering things through catalogs. It, during this period, we have radio, we have film, we have um, a lot, a lot more advertising and uh, the beginnings of commercialism. Increased population the lingering racial tensions after slavery and reconstruction, um, technological changes, the rise of youth culture. Prior to this point, you have children and you have adults, but here you sort of have the idea coming up, particularly with the car, um, of teenage, the, the, the life of a teenager. Um, more education. I don't have that in here, but that's a, a very large change. Progressivism, we have less children um, working. So 
more education, less child labor, but also the fear of eroding traditions. And, and some of the writers are pushing for these traditions to be erased, and some of them are going to be kind of anxious and worried about it. So some aspects of modernism, huh, you can see here even the changes in, in art. Um, this is Edith Wharton and her dogs. <laughs> She's a, a modern writer, her hat there. Um, themes of alien alienation and disconnect, frequent use of irony and understatement, experimentation with new literary techniques in fiction and poetry. I think a lot of these we take for granted now, but there are things like having a flashback or a flash forward, having a, um, a, a, a narrative that jumps around a bit as opposed just from going, you know, from point A to point B, having more subplots, those kind of things. Stream of consciousness writing, inner dialogue, fragments. There's a lot of push to create a new style and to experiment. There's also a rise at this point, um, not a complete rise, but a beginning of more ethnic writers, female writers, trying to give a voice to pre previously marginalized individuals, celebrating diverse backgrounds and points of view. I think prior to that point, you don't have that as much. Um, here, people of different races, dif different ethnicities, um, be sometimes um, some writers of different genders or sexuality, we, we would have that in this period. And there's one of them, <laughs> Gertrude Stein, who wrote about her life with her lover, Alice, um, which is not something that I think would have been published in the previous period. Um, Zora Neale Hurston. So this period includes lost generation writers um, like Stein and Hemingway, who we see here naked with a gun. Um, he does have pants on. <laughs> the images poets, experimental poets, Harlem re Renaissance writers like Hurston, um, Southern Renaissance writers. Drama also becomes a major genre prior to this point. You had plays in the United States, but I I wouldn't say that they were as celebrated as they became during this period. And marginalized voices, as I said, feminist writers, um, new ethnic or racial and class perspectives, new gender and sexuality perspectives and things of that nature. So here are some quotes um, about modernism. Modernism released us from the constraints of everything that had gone before with a euphoric sense of freedom. So the wonderful idea that writers can be free from constraints, that they can think outside the box, so to speak, that they can experiment with form and and begin to question a lot of the traditions that came before. Um, what modern art means is that you have to keep finding new ways to express yourself, to express the problems, that there are no settled ways, no fixed approach. This is a painful situation, and modern art is about this painful situation of having no absolutely definite way of expressing yourself. So kind of the same idea in this quote and, and talking about art, which would include music and literature and things of that nature, you have at this point jazz experimental jazz, which would be very similar to what people were trying to do with writing. Now, from a more negative point of view, the modern mind is in complete disarray. Knowledge has stretched itself to the point where neither the world nor our intelligence can find any foothold. It is a fact that we are suffering from nihilism. Um, so the idea that kind of came out of modernism was the rejection of religious principles, of moral principles, the belief that life is meaningless. That's that's essentially what nihilism is. In philosophy, it's extreme skepticism. So nothing in the world is real or nothing really matters. So I have this quote because it really does inform the modernist writers. There is quite a pessimistic sense that does any of this matter? And to me, a lot of this comes out of that naturalism. Um, 
although the modernists don't look as much at science, at evolution, or at fate, um, which is not science, but, <laughs> but kind of going along with that, they don't look at that as much, but I do think that that pessimism kind of carried over into modernism. But it's definitely a rejection of realism because they're not trying to depict things as they are. They're trying to depict they're trying to depict a little more, I think, inner life as opposed to verisimilitude. They're trying to um, throw that away, that technique away and, and experiment. And um, then we have this. Modernism may be seen as an attempt to reconstruct the world in the absence of God. And that kind of goes again with the nihilism. Um, so these are the two ideas, I think, of modernism to me. One is this sense of freedom, of um, freedom of expression and of experimentation with, with form, with characters, with symbolism, um, looking at themes and, and questioning things and talking about things that couldn't be talked about before. Um, you know, we're not Victorians as Americans, but that, that Victorian idea of secrecy and privacy and, and, and stuffiness, throwing that away. On the other hand, the chaos of that when you throw things away and the doubt, um, those are the two things driving this. Freedom on the one hand and, and complete chaos and disarray and pessimism on the other hand. So postmodernism takes these a little bit further um, and this includes unprecedented prosperity um, at the same time, global conflict, this ranges from after World War II through 1990-ish. Some people say 1980, some people say 1990. I would say 1994 to be more specific, but I have my reasons for that. Um, social protests, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay rights movement, um, mass culture and consumerism, media saturation. This is a little bit before, just before the internet. Um, I say 1994, the internet went public in 93 and then, and then in 1995, um, this is going to sound strange, and if you're still listening to this, but in 1995, we had the um, O.J. Simpson, 94 to 95 was the O.J. Simpson case, where we really saw an explosion of 24-hour news at about the same time that everybody was, was getting access to the internet. So for me... I would say that postmodernism extends from after World War II until the mid 90s when um, the internet kind of ushered in a new era. <clears throat> but other people can disagree with me. They'd be wrong. I'm just kidding. Um, but the rise of te technology, space exploration was during this time. The digital revolution came just at the tail end. I really like this quote quite a bit. Postmodernism was a reaction to modernism. Where modernism was about objectivity, postmodernism was about subjectivity. Modernism sought a singular truth, postmodernism sought the multiplicity of truths. To me, this is the key question of postmodernism. Um, what is true and how does your perspective and my perspective, how are they going to differ when looking at the same event? So the post, the modernists kind of, as I said, try to get rid of um, traditions and, and sorry about that. So Postmodernists create traditional works without traditional structure or narrative. For example, multiple first-person narrators, unreliable narrators, changes in time. And, and really, again, the idea is subjectivity, um, that modernists try to look at things objectively without the lens of traditional values. Um, and they try to think about things in an objective manner and, and question um, what's going on to become more objective. And as the quote says here, the postmodernists are looking at multiplicity. Um, 
and and different people's truths and what that means. Sometimes there are no heroes and anti-heroes are common. There are rarely happy endings. Writings are often critical and ironic. So concentrating on surface realities, the absurdity of daily life, questioning of authority, the past, morality, and again, the nature of truth. They address social issues related to gender and race and youthful rebellion. The tone is often detached or unemotional. Individuals sometimes seem isolated. Movement from small literary circles to diversity and multiculturalism. That kind of happens... um, as postmodernism progresses. And again, another reason that I don't feel like we're in this period right now, I think that the idea of diversity um, with things like changes in publishing and ebooks and things like that, uh, anybody can can write and be published. Um, doesn't mean that it's going to be good or read by many people, but anybody could be published. Whereas previously, that was really not the case. Um, So postmodernism is going to include some of these authors, experimental forms, the beat poets pictured here, um, confessional poets, genre fiction, horror, science fiction, fantasy, mystery, all of that um, becomes quite popular during this period. Multicultural literature, more diverse voices. I like here the Amy Tan quote, my work might only be words, but behind the words, there's a lot of contemplation about human nature. Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> it should be noted. Oh, I already said this. So yeah, um, some people would say that our current period is postmodern. Other people would say that because of the internet, the availability of publishing um, through small presses, print on demand, new media, ebooks, podcasts, blogs, social media, really that that began a new movement or a new literary period. I think too, it's kind of too soon to tell. But I think really that at least since the mid 90s that that writing has changed quite a bit. So we will be looking at books from the realist period, from the modernist period, from the postmodern, and then um, also a book that kind of could be postmodern or could be thought of as contemporary as well. A few major themes that we're going to be talking about. This is not a complete list. Um, last time I gave this presentation in class, somebody asked me if if these were all of them, so I added the, the words a few. Um, what it means to be American. American individualism and the self-made man, those are going to be quite important. We talked about that with transcendentalism, but really that's a thought that comes through American literature um, throughout all time. And also questioning those ideals too. Should Americans be so individualistic? Can people be self-made men if things like genetics or fate or um, discrimination are working against them? The American dream and who can achieve that and who struggles to achieve it. Diversity and difference versus conformity. So things like sexuality, gender, economic differences, regional differences with regionalism, um, racial or ethnic ethnic or cultural differences and the tension between that and sort of mainstream American culture, Um, even differences in thought of, of people who might seem like they fit into mainstream American culture, but don't loss of innocence and coming of age. Um, even if that coming of age happens later um, to someone who is an adult, we're going to look at that in one of our texts um, in particular. Alienation and isolation versus community, a changing moral landscape in each of these periods. Um, the writers are going to question the changes to morality and ask, like, are these changes really good? Do we want this? Do we not? Human nature and then truth, objectivity, and subjectivity. What it, what are what does it mean to have truth? Is there universal truth? Can we be objective, or should we look at things through our own lens and through our own experiences? So I really look forward to talking with you guys about these things, and I hope that in the presentations about the books themselves, you can understand. If this was a little bit confusing, once we get into those books, you can understand them a bit more. So that's it. Hope to see you next time. Thanks.